Hi, everyone. Or not. Sitting in with us. Um, at Dude Solutions, we want to empower our employees to take ownership over their own careers. Lori Bush is here with us today to discuss how to forge your own path and how to get out of your own way. Lori Bush is a self-described, proud of it, as a technology advocate and self-made career in technology advocate and self-professed gadget girl. With an insatiable curiosity for combining technology and public good, she has championed technology adoption and carry through the technology task force and the town's open data program and smart cities expansion, while also working full time at Cisco Systems, where she creates solutions for learning and education, training the next generation of networkers. Lori also continues to have a passion for ensuring the cyber safety and security of students, schools, teaching internet safety classes to parents and kids while stalking their social media accounts to help them stay safe online. She has served on many nonprofit organizations, including the National Institute of Urban, Urban Search and Rescue, the Greater Carolinas Multiple Sclerosis Society, the NC State Hunt Library Advisory Board, the NC Museum of Natural Sciences, and the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Her spare time is spent with her husband and two children, one a Tar Heel graduate living in NYC, and the other attending Emerson College. You may see Lori out on the road in her elf as an avid cyclist or dancing away at Jazzercise. Please join me in welcoming Lori Bush. Hello. Wow. I just, um, normally it's like, uh, they're coming up to the podium and they're really unhappy about something. Um, well, thank you for inviting me here. I have been in this building before. Um, when I work at learning at Cisco, at Cisco Systems. Uh, I've been there 23 years, it seems like yesterday. And um, one of my partners is Global Knowledge next door. So I've been in this area, I know where you are. Um, and I go to the Coca booth all the time. So I hope you guys enjoy your amazing view because there are a lot of people who would kill to work in this area. I work from home. So normally I'm business from here up and party on the bottom. Right, because I'm on video all day, maybe like some of you are all, I have this great, and for women, guys, you, I don't think you can do this as well, but I have this huge honking necklace by my video camera that I put on over a t-shirt, and it looks like I am totally dressed up, right? And they're like, ah, you work from home, you got all dressed up, and I'm like, I did, I did. You know, and I got like yoga pants on the bottom, right? So thank you for having me. Um, normally, when I'm introduced, um, I especially in a presentation. Oh, great. Did it do it? No. See? It's a good thing you're here. Um, when I uh, am introduced, you know, you normally like what your name and your byline, like the company you work for. You know, I, uh, let's see if it'll work. Maybe I'll just run over there. <laughs> oh, did it work? Nope. Nope. And how many times did you test this? This is like demo, the demo god. It's right, you can't not do it. But normally, uh, I'll tell you what it's gonna say. Um, normally you put your name and your company name, right? It doesn't really describe who you are, it describes where you work. And for some of us, it describes, like I'm a Cisco Systems Engineer. I'm also the Kerry Mayor Pro Tem, um, which is, I'm also the at-large representative for all of Kerry, which means, um, at-large representative means that everybody in Kerry who can vote, hopefully vote for me. They did in the last election because I was the only one on the ballot. But um, actually, that's not true. About 23 people voted for someone else, right? Did you ever wonder that? Like, what do you do, right? With, you know, for um, at-large candidate, it said Lori Bush, and then it had a line, right? And so I wanted to know who would not, who would put something on there? Like, maybe they put their own name, right? No, they put Mickey Mouse, right? Some people put anybody but. Like, oh, oh, it just like stabbed me in the heart, right? But, um, but so I'm the Carrie Mayor Pro Tem. If you don't know what Carrie Mayor Pro Tem means, it's that I'm the mayor when the mayor's not around. I don't see him here, so I'm the mayor. <laughs> um, but I wish that whenever we wrote presentations like this, that we actually said a little bit about who we were, right? So yeah, I'm the Carrie Mayor Pro Tem. I happen to be a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a you know, sister, I'm a caregiver, I ride my bike, I'm a geek, I love chocolate, 
Um, it's a good thing that all that candy right there is peppermint because I don't like that or I would have moved it over. Um, I figured out that I'm what we call a servant leader. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. I'm a, a, prover, um, I'm a giver and I'm also an approval sock. I will do pretty much anything so you will say thank you. Right? I, I, it's very hard for approval sock people to say no. Right? You know how when you go into an interview and somebody says, what are your, what are your great things? Right? What, what, what do you do well and what are your weaknesses? I hate that question. Right? And your weaknesses are, oh, I have a difficult time saying no. That's like the best answer ever. But I really do have a difficult time saying no. So what I'm here to talk to you about, it worked, nice job, um, is how you can create whatever your story is, right? So your story, your journey, your path, whatever it is, may look like a house, it may not, right? It may be about having kids, it is perfectly fine to not. You know, it might be that you're an urbanite and you want to, you know, be in your space. Maybe you're a quiet person, you're an introvert, you don't like to do the things that I'm doing right now, and that's cool. But what is it that you want to do and how do you want to get there? Or do you want to just have life kind of hit you, right? So how do you be intentional about making a plan and declaring it, because that's a really big important thing about making a plan and achieving it. And then how do you navigate some of the roadblocks, right? So I'm, what I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about my story and then just some key takeaways that I've taken from it. They may or may not work for you. <laughs> I, wish some, I wish I was sitting in your seat like 20 years, okay, maybe 40 years ago and somebody was like, oh, here are the really cool things that you should really think about doing because I would have so listened to that person. But nobody told me any of this, and it took me a lot of training and a lot of heartache. And so if it helps you, that's great. If it doesn't help you, that's great too, right? So let's see. So normally, right, when you hear, when you read those beautiful books or you, you know, hear about um, Thoreau, right, or, and you're, you know, what is the, I, I want to take the path, right, not taken, the road less traveled. This is where I want to go. And everything is looking so clear right? It's either this way or that way, right? And normally, there's some sort of decision point. Oh, I'm going to go maybe left or right, right? Or I don't know, maybe I'll just wait here for a minute and I'll make this decision later, right? Because I don't need to make the decision right now. Um, maybe I need to really hurry up because there's something at the other end that means I have to quickly get there. And the decision you might make would be, do you do take this road or this path alone? Or do you bring other people along with you? And then you have to make sometimes decisions. Okay, well, I might take that job because it offers more money, but it's not really the job I want. But right now, because my family, I need more money. Or you might say, you know what? A lot of millennials are making choices not based on money so much anymore. They're making choices based on happiness quotient right? And it's more, my happiness is more important than a boat, right? So that might be the decision you make. And then there's a whole bunch of other decisions that I haven't even thought of yet, right, that are important to you. Maybe it's family, maybe it's religion, maybe it's location, maybe it's the weather. I can't get my brother to move out of California because he likes the weather, right? I, he just won't leave. Oh, it's so hot in North Carolina. Really? Okay, it is today, but right, why would I ever want to go there? So these are decisions that you have to make, right? So the path never looks like this. I mean, it, it rarely looks like this. It looks more like this, right? Where there's no clear way to get from A to B, and you don't even know where A or B is. Like, is B way up here? Or are you going to skip B, right, and maybe sit on this rock? right? And try to figure out what path. And you know what? You may jump from place to place trying to get to the end result. And any of those is right. But on the previous one, it looks so clear. You had one way to go. And why would you go through the woods, right? Because you had this nice clear path. But on this way, it's not really that clear, right? And you may have a backpack and you may have a lot of baggage that says to you, you know what? 
I might just wait until somebody else comes along to help me. And this is kind of like an esoteric, I don't know, metaphor for life, right? So how do you get from one place to the other, right, when it's not really clear? So what I thought we would do is try to talk about the whys, right? So why is it important that there's even a path to begin with, right? And what does your own path look like, right? And why is this important that you even consider it? Because you could, you could have not come here today, right? Or you could just be living your life, right? Especially, I'll just take a brief moment. When you're a parent, you've got little kids, you are just lucky to get up in the morning, get them out the door, get back and make sure they have some sort of food in their stomach, right? And you just try to get to Friday, right? And that's hard. And, and you're sitting, if, you, if, if this were me um, 20 years ago, or I guess my kids are, 23 and 20, 20 years ago, I'd be like, yeah, I still have no time to figure out my path, right? I'm like, I, I don't even have the same shoes on today, right? And this might not be a time for you to consider why, but it might be something that you think about now so that when you do have time, you start to think about it. So I thought I'd start a little bit with my story. Um, I met Pam 17 years ago, I think. Um, we were connected. Um, but before that, uh, this is me. Uh, gosh, I was kind of cute. And then I had long hair then, Pam. You were asking. I did. I had a hair. Um, now I'm, uh, you know, I'm old. I don't have time for that. Um, and I grew up in St. Louis, uh, right in the heart of the Midwest. I um, was a daughter of a single parent, um, and I have a brother as well. Um, and at that time um, in our lives, we were, we were struggling. Um, we were on food stamps. We were in subsidized housing. Uh, my mom, I'm the first one from my family to graduate from college. And it was, it was pretty tough. It was a pretty tough time. Um, but I went to the University of Missouri Rolla, which is now called the Missouri School of Science and Technology. They changed the name like 20 or 15 years before I went. It was called the Missouri School of Mines. I don't know why they like to change the name hence the minor at the top. Um, and uh, I started working for IBM in 1983. Don't even tell me that some of you weren't born then yet. Um, and I uh, co opted and then worked for them for 12 years. And then I started at Cisco three years after they IPO'd. Um, if I was smart, I would have taken the offer they gave me in 1991. Uh, and then, then I might be on a boat somewhere. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we each have our journey, and um, both my husband and I worked at IBM, and it was a good time to diversify. Uh, IBM had their first layoff in 75 years. The year before I moved to Cisco, I thought it was a pretty good time to diversify our income. So uh, that's my family, my two kids. My daughter lives in New York City. She's a PR um, and advertising in Manhattan. She will never come home. Um, Carrie is a nice bedroom community, but it's not any fun, for, apparently, if you're 23. Um, and my son is, um, it's so hard for me to say this, he's a musical theater major. I'm an engineer, right? And both of my kids are in the arts. Uh, but he's a musical theater major at Emerson College in Boston. And then there's, um, then there's the rest of my life. Uh, this is an elf. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a bike. I know it doesn't look like a bike, but it really is. It's like a tricycle. Uh, it's solar powered. It has electric assist. Um, if you see the green one, there's only one green one in Carrie. It's me. Um, there's an orange one, too. Very nice lady. Um, <laughs> people are like, I saw you. I was like, she's 80. <laughs> so I'll just put it out there like that. Very nice lady. Um, but I like to ride it around. I write it to um, a lot of, uh, I write, used to ride it to work when I worked at Cisco, ride it back and forth. It was only five miles back and forth. Uh, because it's solar panel, I could leave it out and it would charge up by the time I was there. And uh, this is council. And uh, I made them take this picture. Um, this is the side of council. You probably never see us when we're on TV or whatever. Um, they are kind of crazy. There's seven of us. Uh, two, the, the mayor's in the middle. I'm at large. And Ed Yerha, he's at large. And then we have four other people who represent the districts here and carry A, B, C, and D, so easily named. Um, 
and we've all been serving. I think we have a combined experience of like 70 years on the council, which is a bit unusual. Jack is the oldest serving one. He takes most of it. He's 28 years. So he, the rest, I've been on council for six years and they're four year terms. So I'm in my second four year term. So that, that's me. Um, if you were to look at my story, there you go, it might seem pretty easy, right? It might seem like, oh, you had this direct path. You were, you know, this kid, this, you know, geeky girl. And of course you were going to work at IBM. And of course you were going to, you know, be a computer engineer. And of course you might serve the public. Yeah, not so much. Um, it, it, and I wish I could find a woman one, but just imagine, that's my short hair. Um, so I got a computer um, engineering degree from the University of Missouri Rala, and um, I loved it in school. In fact, my husband hates that I say this, but I never debugged a program in my four years at a master's in uh, robotics. I always wrote it right the first time. Now, this is a time when we had cards, too. So when I started, I know you don't know what that is. There's not a single one of you old enough in here. But we used to program on cards. And we have to carry this great big card deck to the mainframe. I know you can't even believe it. I see your look like, what the heck? I think I still have some of those cards left over. And then you, if you were smart, you numbered them because if you dropped them, every card was a line of code. And you would feed it in, right? And then your program would run. And I was just so careful that I never debugged code. Um, I don't know why that is, but when I got to IBM, I realized how much I really hate coding. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know how to debug. I, I had code that wasn't working. I'm like, what? I've never had that before. I really hated it. And I'm an extrovert. I know it's really hard for you to believe, but most of my <laughs> coworkers were introverts, right? Like, I talk to think and they think to talk. So we'd be in a meeting and there'd be dead silence, right? I'm like, what, is your hard drive working? What, what's going on? Give me some feedback. I just hated it. And I was the only woman hired at IBM in 1987 in IBM in Endicott, New York. Um, I didn't really know what to do. I thought I was gonna have to quit, go back to school. Um, I didn't know what to do. So uh, a woman pulled me aside. As, at that time, we called them secretaries, but an admin pulled me aside. Very, uh, she had to be in her late 50s. She says, you're, you're having a hard time. I said, I am. You don't like your job. I do not. Now, this is, this is a secretary, right? I, someone who I didn't expect, right? Didn't have the qualification. But her emotional intelligence was so keen, right? Because sometimes we place people in different roles. Oh, she's a secretary. She might not know. She had worked with all the executives. She knew. She said, honey, you are not gonna last here. You're not. But I need, there's a couple of people that I know who have skills that you have who might be really helpful to you, and I'd like to introduce you to them. And so what I did was I met with them and I found out that I actually had a lot of value as a product manager, as a um, systems engineer. I could take my, my greatest strength at that time was taking really complex ideas and translating them into something that the customer can understand, and vice versa, taking a customer requirement and converting it into a real technical requirement that I could put into code, right? But there was no such thing as product management in college. There was not a degree in product management. Nobody really talked about that. So that took me onto a new path. I was like, okay, this is kind of half. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy. I want to jump onto another path, right? Got to, got to expand my life a little bit. Now, by now, I have two kids, no time. Remember the shoes that don't match. Um, but I really wanted to give back. I was, I either worked or took care of the kids. I had no, I had no connection, right? I had my work friends, but I didn't really have any friends outside of that. And, um, but I really like to play around with code still from time to time, as long as you know, it wasn't a full-time job. So I created a website and a newsletter from my neighborhood, Preston Village. Um, and then, of course, the minute you volunteer for something, you're now being voluntold to do something else. 
So uh, I joined the Homeowners Association, which by the way, if you've never done that before, it's like serving time in jail. <laughs> it's like, it's the hardest job ever, ever. Because you know, they're your neighbors and they're your friends and you're telling them you really need to mow the lawn. Or, you know, you're not allowed to put that shrub there, right? It's a hard job. Um, and I, although it was hard to do, I actually wanted to do more. And I started helping on some campaigns. I met someone at that time, his name was Harold Weinbrack. He's now the mayor. Um, I had met him. I went to the Town of Carey School of Government because I wanted to learn more about how government works. And I started helping on campaigns. And I kind of thought, yeah, that's filling up, filling up my cup, right? And then 9-11 happened. Um, little known story. Pam's the only one in this room that I think that knows this. Um, I had a seat on the American Airlines flight 11 that um, crashed out of Boston, uh, went from Boston to LA and um, God, I still can't talk about it this long. Um, uh, the World Trade Center. On Sunday, I was a manager, right? At, by then, I was working at Cisco. I was a manager and um, I was supposed to go fly to Boston on Monday and then my, my team was all in Boston. And then two of us were supposed to fly from Boston to LA, have a meeting in LA, and then fly to Seattle. Um, I was a very judgmental manager, let's just put it that way. And when I didn't get the full itinerary from my employee um, on Saturday, I got really angry and I canceled the flight for us. I said, we're not going, you're not ready. You will need to call the customer and tell them, tell them we won't be going. And um, he was mad because I think he maybe had set up some of the things in LA and Seattle. Um, and I said, no, you're, you're just not ready. I will come up next week. I'll do a full week of meetings. We'll do our performance reviews and we'll talk about how we can avoid this in the future. I had canceled the flight through American Airlines but I hadn't told American Express, which meant Cisco didn't know, which also meant my mother didn't know. So I'm sitting there. <laughs> so what happens if you're, if you're a woman and you find free time, right, that you didn't know you had? So I went and got a haircut. So I'm sitting there at like 8.30 in the morning, right? Got my hair, you guys don't know this, but we sometimes do things to our hair that makes us look really fun. I, my hair was in foils, right? And my, we didn't have cell phones then. I mean, I had this big honking cell phone, um, but my pager's going off. It's going off. And it's going off. I'm like, what is going on? Everybody thinks I'm on a plane. Why are they paging me? Right? There's, why is my cell phone going off? And um, it was because Cisco and my mom and my department thought I was on the plane. Right? Um, and I, I was, I was moved. Right, the only, I, I would, you know, people can say, oh, it was God, it was the energy, it was the universe, it was circumstances, whatever it was, it was something that gave me a wake up. And uh, Cisco stopped all travel for the week, um, but I had a good friend, Suzanne Kelly, who was on the flight that um, went into the Pentagon. So I was allowed to travel to her funeral in um, San Jose. Um, and there, at the funeral, the entire church, which was packed full, John Chambers gave the eulogy, it was really quite, quite amazing, were all of her work friends. Nobody else. Her work friends only. Her family, some family members, that was it. The people, don't get me wrong, it was amazing that she had touched these people. But she had not touched anyone outside of work. She had no connection to her community, no connection um, to anyone else, no deep connection. And so the whole way home, um, I cried. I, I cried because of her loss, but I also cried because I think it, it was demonstrative of what my funeral might have looked like, right? I, 
even though I had done some of these other things, I don't know that I had touched anyone or made any difference. Like, what did that look like? And it was a huge reset for me, uh, which is when I met Pam. Um, so I decided to, all right, reset time. <laughs> I went to all this training, right? Clearly, I need some help. <laughs> I, need, I need to reassess my life, figure out what I want to be, where I want to go. I was kind of on auto autopilot. I mean, I was getting some help here and there, but I really didn't feel like I was on any sort of trajectory. So I took some training. I spent more family time. I decided that in order to get back, I needed to get a different job. So I joined the Homeland Security group at Cisco. Um, that group was the group that put the phones, the IP phones in that you guys see, the Cisco phones in the emergency communication center on the pier in New York City. I flew up there. Um, and then I was on site for uh, Hurricane Katrina for 18 months, helping with the, um, with the restoration there. Basically, what I started doing was declaring my intention. I still, though, didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought, you know what? I stood up 17 years ago in this training where we were making our declarations, and I had no idea what I wanted to be, right? I had no idea. And I stood up in the middle of this room, and I said, they said, come up with something that you think in 10 or 20 years, you want to be able to look back and say, I did this, right? I had not run for office. I mean, I knew this one guy, Harold, who was on the council, but it never occurred to me. I don't know. Out of somewhere, I said, someday I'm going to be Carrie Mayer. And not a single person laughed. But I was kind of laughing at myself. I'm like, that is the stupidest thing I should have said. Like, I want to win the lottery or something like that. It would never happen. But that was, my, uh, that was my intention. So I decided to run for office. Um, by the way, I lost. <laughs> I ran for District A. Um, I got my uh, first election, the runoff, by four votes. And then um, I ran, uh, got the runoff, and then I lost by 100 votes. 100 votes out of 10,000. Not bad. Um, so I decided I should go back to training. <laughs> Right? Isn't that what you do? Like, oh, okay, how do I reset? And I did that, declared some new attention, and, um, and then in 2011, I won my uh, at-large seat. Uh, last year, I was declared the mayor pro tem. And so now what I've done is taken my intentions, right, my goal of serving the less wealthy in our community, and I've made affordable housing one of my key tenets and working on that. I'm also the only technologist on council. I'm the only one that, that knows how to use their phone. Um, and, uh, and I'm making some new plans. So this is my story. As you can see, it goes all over the place, right? There, it might look like the outside, oh, yeah, she was on this trajectory. She made a declaration 17 years ago that she was going to be the mayor. There was no way that that was going to happen. So what you can see is I bounced around just like you're going to bounce around. But there are some things that you can do to help the bouncing not be maybe as painful when you hit a rock or make yourself more resilient so that you can jump to the next one. So the first thing you have to do is figure out where you want to go and why. That is the hardest thing to do. It's the first thing you have to do, but it's also the hardest thing to do. But there are some ways. To do it. So what I'm going to do with you is talk about how we can, what tools you can use, what plans you can make, people you can pull into your group circle, your you know circle of trust, right? Um, and the plan is going to be unique. My plan looked me forthright, but my plan was my plan, right? Yours is going to be totally about you, who you are, what background you come from, you know, what's your sphere of influence. And, and what matters to you, and then you, how to maybe create some, I don't know, some other people to help you along the way. So the first thing you got to do, this is going to look familiar to Pam because we were brainstorming this, is you got to take an inventory, right? Take an inventory of you. Now, this is where you can get some help, right? So, like, what skills do you have? What is kind of the knowledge base that you have? Right? One of my skills is taking really complex things and describing them to people in not so complex words. Right? Something connecting with them, telling a story. 
And how can you use that skill in a different way, right? I was a computer engineer, but I wasn't really using my full coding skills, let's say, as a product manager. But I knew that when the engineers say, oh, yeah, we can't do that, I knew that that was crap. Oh, yeah, I could code that, right? So you're using your skills in a new way, but also identify where your gaps are, right? So maybe, um, this happened to me last week, I suck at Excel. I've taken three Excel classes. I have great respect for people who are good at Excel. Pivot charts and all that stuff is so cool. I am not good at that. So write some things down that you don't do well, that you want to do, you know, maybe better, or tap into somebody who does it well, right? Find out your strengths and your weaknesses, but you're going to have to focus on your strengths. Because, by the way, just to give you a little insight, there was a study done, um, I think it was five years ago, um, and it's detailed in the Strengths Finder book, if you've ever read that, which said, okay, if I'm going to take a group of people who all want to read better, right, they want to be faster, have better comprehension, and I get a group of people, one, who are good readers already, and a group of people who are not good readers, right, and I teach them fast reading skills, right, in your mind, you would think, right, if you're already a good reader, how much could you improve? right? But if you're, you are not so good, right? I should be able to raise the bar for you, right? I mean, it just makes sense, right? I'm going to improve you and make you a better reader. Actually, the opposite is true. The study took two groups, and the people who were good readers did 3,000 times better than the group who were poor readers. They did maybe 10 to 15 percent better, right? Because the, it makes sense when you think about it. If you already like to do it, you're going to do it better, right? So find your strengths, find your gaps. But don't focus on the gaps. Focus on the strengths. Because you'll get better at your strengths quicker than you'll get better at your weaknesses. The other thing you need to do is figure out what, what you like to do. What's your passion? Is your passion the environment and you're a hiker? You should write that down. Um, what are the things that you do, and then the next thing you know, it's already the end of the day because you loved it so much the time just flew by. It might not be the things at the top of your head, right? Think about um, when you've gone on vacation. What are the things you really enjoy doing? You know, and also, what are the things that you're doing that maybe you shouldn't be doing anymore because they just don't, they don't serve you? <coughs> Find out if there's a way that you can make your passion your job, right? And then finally, what are the things that bring you joy and fulfill you, bring meaning to your life, right? Um, what does meaning a life of no regret mean to you? When I was sitting in the pew and looking at all the people that were Suzanne's friends from work, I put myself in that place and wondered if I were looking at that, would I have felt regret seeing that they were only co-workers. For me, that mattered. That might not matter to you, but for me, that mattered. That I didn't make any impact except outside the people who were certainly making money off of my skill set, right? And that wasn't important to me. One of the unique exercises that I did in one of my classes was we wrote our own epitaph, right? What would your epitaph be? What would you want it to be? And by the way, this is really depressing, but it can be really uplifting, right? What do you want to be known for? The exercise, you know, she was whatever, right? Write your obit. What would you like it to be? Not what is it now, but what would you like it to be? She touched these people. She brought a cure for cancer, right? Whatever it is. She's a park, you know? Uh, Marla Durrell Park is a perfect, perfect example. Marla Durrell was a council member had a, a unique ability to reach kids with special needs. And so the Marla Durrell camp, the Kids Together camp, is a camp for kids with special needs, kids um, in wheelchairs, kids who have a hard time getting from place to place, because that was her passion. I'm sure that if she were to write her epitaph, she would say that she made a difference for all kids. So write yours. For, my, for me, it took me a long time but I'm a servant leader. I'm a public servant. I'm either serving the public at work because of, I'm 
right now as at Learning in Cisco, I'm about creating the next generation of network engineers, or I'm a public servant in my night job at the town council, right? But it took me a long time to figure this out. I'm 54. I wish I knew this at 34 or 44. I wasted a lot of time. Um, it's not a waste. Then, so you got your assessment, right? You got your inventory. Now you need to make it real, right? And the way you make it real is by creating a vision and writing it down, right? Break up that vision into achievable goals, right? Make them small enough so that you have something to celebrate. Because if you say, like I did 17 years ago, I'm going to be Carrie Mayer and that's all I ever said, I would have never been Carrie Mayer, right? You have to break it up. You have to declare it. You have to tell other people. You need accountability, right? And they can't be your spouse or your friend. They need to be somebody who's going to hold you accountable, right? And you need to make a plan. Now, there is, it is not, I didn't just pick this graphic because it said write it down. I picked it for a very specific purpose because there are scientific studies that show that the hand eye mind connection is real. If you write something in pen, in a fountain pen, in pencil, it's real. If you type it, it's not real because you don't remember typing. You remember writing things down. So get a book, write it down, keep it with you. It's really important. One of the most important skills ever is listening. Um, well, on my journey for learning, this was my biggest aha moment. I thought I was listening, right? I would sit at the council table, or actually before when I was on planning and zoning board, or even in meetings, right? And I'm sitting there, and somebody's talking, and they are just going on and on. You ever had this? And you are thinking about what you're going to say next. When they take a breath, you are ready. Sometimes you don't wait for a breath, but you're ready. And when you are thinking about what you're going to say, there's a really key point there, and that is that you aren't really listening to them because you're thinking about what you're going to say. You can't do both at the same time. That's not one of the multitasking things that you can actually do, right? So you have to pay attention to them. When you're looking at them, right, this, this is like such the picture I wish this was my son because he's always like that, right? The eyes rolled up in the back of his head. But you can tell the mom is trying to connect. She's looking at him. She's trying to get his attention. He is definitely not paying attention, right? He is not listening, right? They might as well just stop because all he hears is wah, 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 right? He's not listening. And so what you need to do is get in front of the person you really want to listen to. You need to you know, look at them. You need to give them feedback that I'm hearing you. I'm shaking my head. Um, I might even reflect back what you said because it's so important for me to learn and for you to know that it matters what you said, that I might reflect it back. So what you said is, did I get this right? Right? Ask questions. Right? Show you're listening. No matter what you do, do not interrupt. Do not interrupt them. I don't know how to say it. I mean, that's the biggest, boldest type I could put here. Don't interrupt them because there's four things that says to them. The first is, anybody know? What do you think it says? What? Sorry? Right. What you're, say what you're saying is not important to me because you're talking and I interrupted you. Exactly. What was the other one you said? You're not listening, right. You're actively, so you're not important to me. You're really not listening. Anyone else? Yes, I'm more important than you. Or put it the other way, you don't matter, right? You don't matter. What I say is more important and you don't matter, right? And there's a fourth one, anyone? When you interrupt, what do you feel? Exactly. You want to be right. I can't tell you how many times I would do this, too, because it was so important for me to be right. 
was so, so, so important. I'm so, I was so judgmental. I still am judgmental. I try not to show it, right? Because you can't like change who you are. You can kind of soften it. I'm still judgmental. I'm still judging you, right? I am. But I'm tempering it, right? And we have this need to be right. I still do it today when my husband, and it, it, my husband does it to me all the time. I'll say, oh, yeah, we have to leave at, you know, 545. You know, it's about, it's uh, 530 now. He goes, no, it's 527. What? <laughs> really? It was that important for you to be right? Oh, 527. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. You've got to stop trying to be right. Because it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. And the way to not feel like you need to be right is to be open-minded. Think about the possibility that you might actually learn something when you're not trying to be right. Um, not to put politics into it, but this is a really divisive time right now, right? I don't care what side of the fence you're on. I am a flaming liberal, just to be totally honest. Um, I, have, I have family members who have blocked me from their Facebook account. Um, and, and it's because they wanted to be right, right? So they put all this stuff up there and I would respond and they just didn't want any, they didn't want to have any conversation. They didn't want the opportunity to learn about what I thought while I was still open to learning about what they thought, right? And that's the problem right now. We are all trying so hard to be right that we're not listening. My best friend on the council is the farthest leaning right person and we sit right next to each other and he's my best friend on the council. So he's a gun-toting, uh, smoking, uh, oh, auto mechanic, right, small business owner, you know, and I'm pretty much everything opposite of that, right? And uh, we purposefully drive to retreats together two or three hours just so we can talk, just so we can learn from each other. It's really fun to see us on a bus together because we'll go at it. You know, I'll be like abortion rights and he'll be like, you know, pro-life and we'll go back and forth and people start moving away on the bus, right? And it's because we learn from each other, right? Um, I respect the fact that he cares so deeply. I don't agree with him, but I still respect him. And if you're interrupting and if you're thinking about what you're going to say next, right, and if you want to be right, you are not listening. This is the most important skill you can work on. In fact, this was so important to me that I wrote down all these things that I'm telling you. That's why I know it without even looking at it. And I have it on a sheet of paper near my, near my phone, right? Because I tend to, <laughs> I'm gonna interrupt, right? I tend to wanna be right. I need to stop and think because those are my habits. You need a kitchen cabinet. Uh, years ago, uh, you may have read The Team of Rivals. It's about uh, Abraham Lincoln and about how he created a cabinet. It was the very first cabinet of a presidency. And he included on his cabinet people that ran for office against him and lost. You need a mentor cabinet. You need to think about people that have skills that you don't have or are doing things that you aren't doing, or have the job you want, right? You need to get them on your side, right? And you need to help them help you. Now, this isn't like a parent, and this isn't like a sponsorship, right? Which are very important roles, right? A mentor is somebody who's on your side and helping you along the way. Sponsorship is where you have somebody at a job or an, um, in your job or maybe above you who's sponsoring you, getting you visibility, right? Helping you with your career by helping you within that group. This a mentor is not like that. A mentor is helping you grow skills, um, might be giving you some ideas on how you can think big. Um, they might even, you know, be the devil's advocate, right? Be the yin to your yang. You need quite a few of them too. You need to think about what kind of traits and skills don't you have? Remember that assessment, right? Look for people who can help fill those gaps for you, right? Make sure it's a diverse group. Don't make them all your peeps that you already go to the pool with, right? 
They need to be outside of your sphere of influence, right? They need to be unlike you. Don't have a kitchen cabinet if you're a woman. Don't have a kitchen cabinet of all women. If you're a guy, don't have a kitchen cabinet of all, or a mentor cabinet of all men, right? They shouldn't look like you, right? All races, creeds, colors, <coughs> excuse me, religion. They have to be honest and authentic, and they have to know what they're signing up for, right? So if you're thinking about this, I, the first picture I had was the Three Stooges. And I thought, oh, I can't do that. But they need to be people who can help you on your way, right? So there was a study done by the um, Veterans Association. Um, and the question was, how many mentors is the right number? And the number ranged anywhere from 4 to 27. Um, because the di different kinds of mentors, you need different kinds of mentors for different kinds, types of your life, right? The mentor you have when you're in your 20s or 30s might not be the kinds of skills that you need when you're in your 40s and 50s, right? Um, they do say, though, that the target number to go for is five. <coughs> Excuse me. So find the five people who are outside your current sphere, and here's the conversation you might have. Because this can be hard, right? Like, okay, you know, I've been thinking. You know, I'm off camera. I've been thinking about how good you are at these little doohickeys, right? I really don't have that skill set. Do you think we could, like, you know, go to lunch? You could teach me how to do all that stuff. I'll buy lunch. Yeah, that works. Okay. <laughs> all right. So you start slow, right? Find a trait, find a skill, find something that's going to work, right? One of the um, one of my favorite books is Leadership on the Line, uh, written by um, Heifetz and Linsky. Um, took a class from Marty Linsky at Harvard. Um, one of the things they do is they talk about being on the dance floor and being on the balcony, right? So when you're at a club, tell me all I've been to clubs, right? Do we call them clubs anymore? What do we call them? Come on. If you go out, where do you go? To a bar. And if there's music, it's still a club. Okay, good. It hasn't changed. Not that you would know, because I'm sure you don't go out drinking. No. Right, right. Um, so you're, and you're down there and the music's really hot and you're dancing, you're with all your friends and you are having the best time, right? You might be drinking, you might not be, but it, where you are, it is the best party ever. You're selfieing, you're not, is that a verb? Is that a verb? You know, you're taking pictures, you know, you're having the best time. But another person, one of your other friends just really isn't into it, went up on the balcony of the bar, right, and saw that really, looking from the balcony, the only people having fun is this tiny little group in the corner who were so trashed they didn't realize the music had stopped like 15 minutes ago, right? So that's the difference between being on the dance floor, right, and on the balcony. You get two totally perspectives. So when you're looking for a mentor, you need somebody who can get up on the balcony. Because you're on the dance floor, right? You are in, in part of it. You need somebody who can kind of, you know, take it up a level. Take it up, you know, we used to say 30,000 feet, and I don't even think that phrase is used anymore. You need somebody on the balcony. Then you really need to check your gut from time to time, right? Am I on the right path, right? I don't really, I don't know, it doesn't feel right to me, right? You know what, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was saying to my husband, I think I want to go back to school. He's like, oh, God, no. Really? I said, yeah, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think I want to be a lawyer. He's like, you're 54, right? Um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know. It, it felt right. It felt like maybe I should go back to school. So I called a couple of lawyers. I said, you know, I'm kind of thinking... I don't know, maybe you need to go back to school. They're like, what do you hope to get with a law degree? Oh, that's a really good question. I hadn't thought about it that way. I don't know. So they might say that I'm a lawyer when I walk into rooms. They said, yeah, you don't need that. You're the mayor pro tem. What do you need a law degree for? I'm like, oh, well, I, I don't know. Maybe 
I don't know, I, I just don't feel like I have the tools I need to be successful. Oh, that's a better question. You could probably get a master's in public administration. You could go to the UNC School of Government. You might be able to get where you're going. That was a gut check, right? I might have probably taken the GRE to get in. But you need to check in, right? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Are you uncomfortable? Do you have butterflies? If you don't have butterflies, it's not worth doing right? If you're not scared about an adventure, don't even do it. You should be doing, by the way, on your list of writing down things to do, you should put something that really scares the hell out of you every year. Something big, right? I'm not saying jumping out of an airplane, which I've done, um, and, and you could certainly do it, and that really did scare the crap out of me. But Find something really scary. Maybe it's giving a talk. Public, uh, public speaking is really hard for some people, right? Maybe it's that. Maybe uh, giving a TED talk. We have TEDx's all over. Maybe that's what you want to do. Maybe you want to take a cooking class, right? But you just don't want people to know how bad, uh, you know, how bad you cook or how horribly you slice onions, right? There's something that probably scares you. You should put it on your list to do one thing that scares you, at least one thing that scares you once a year. Find somebody to do it with. And no matter what, check in. Because whatever that is, there's no right or wrong answer. It's for you. It's, it sounds so cliche to say, but it, it really is it. And then one last thing. Women, we do this all the time. I know you guys are not going to believe this. But we kind of wait for other people to say it's OK before we do it. I'm not exactly sure why we do it, but there are, there are several studies that were done Women will not run for office unless they've been asked five times. Five. They won't think about it. So, oh, well, nobody's asked me to run, so why should I run? Same thing with me. I never ran because I really wanted to. I had to wait for like five people to ask me. Women don't ask for raises enough. Women don't ask for promotions enough, right? Here's the, here's the difference. A woman won't run for office until she feels qualified, right? Perfect example. All the women running now that you see, and there's, there are a whole bunch of women running, they felt like, oh, in order to run for the town council, I should first get on the planning and zoning board, and I should go to the school of government, and then I should make sure that I volunteer, right? None of the men on the ballot last year had ever volunteered for the town ever before, ever. One of the questions they got in the debate, they asked, hey, you know, your opponent, the woman, she's been on the planning and zoning board, she's worked for government, what do you think your skills are? The guy says, well, I'm going to learn on the job. That's how I've always done things. It is not wrong, by the way. I'm not dissing the guys. It's a different way of thinking. We need to be, we feel the need to be qualified before we do something, right? I already need to have the skill set to go into this job. But a man, and a lot of it's from um, guys playing sports more in school than we do. They feel that they will learn on the job, right? They already have the skill sets inside, and they'll jump into that job and get, and get what they need. And you don't need to be swayed by your naysayers, right? If somebody says to you, well, you know, what makes you think that you can do this? I don't know. What made him think that he could do this, right? So a perfect example, um, in my at-large election, I had been on the planning and zoning board. I'd gone to the school. I did, I'm exactly this picture, right? I've been to the planning and zoning board. I served as my homeowner association president, which you should get medals for, right? I did all of that. The guy who ran against me was a mortgage broker who lived in the town of Cary for a year and never, ever volunteered for anything. Nothing. I had this long list of all these places I volunteer for. Yeah, 45% of the vote. What? How is that possible, <laughs> right? So it, you've got to think about what it is that you want to do and how you do it, and you have to tamp down your female tendencies sometimes of saying, ooh, I'm not ready, right? Because you are ready. And if you're a guy and you're like, oh, wait, that kind of sounds like me too, do that too because you're ready. If you think you're ready, you're ready. So by the way, if you want to buy this T-shirt, it's on Zazzle. Um, 
this is my t-shirt, about 11 years ago when I was, or 15 years ago when I was creating my plan, right? Um, someone said, why, why do you think you can do this? And I said, well, you know, I think I have to think big and I have to start really small, but then I have to scale fast. And, and somebody said, oh, you should put that on a t-shirt. So I did. Then I put drink often on the back. This is, no lie, this is a screen capture from Zazzle. <laughs> you, can, you can buy it. I think I got 10 cents last year. Somebody bought a couple of them. Um, but that's really how I think, you know, the best way for you to start is think really big, right? Reassess what, assess who you are. Take your inventory. Start to use some of these skill sets that you know you have, but you just haven't used. Be reminded. Create your kitchen cabinet, right? Check in. And make sure you do something that scares you and keeps you really excited. And then, if you don't drink, I'm sorry, but drink. Find new people that you have. If you're in a if you're in a meeting, right? The thing I do, and my husband hates it. He's an introvert, so you know I'm like 99.9 percent .9 extrovert. My husband's like 99.9 .9 percent introvert. True, true. Um, but he loves to sit there and watch. Right? He's a watcher. So I told him one day, do one thing for me. He's like, oh, God, what? We've been married 28 years, so. I said, when you go into a meeting, just introduce yourself to one person. Just one. It's hard. If you're, if you're a flaming introvert, that is really hard. That takes all of your energy. You're exhausted the rest of the day. Totally, totally, right? I'm exhausted after working from home all day because it's the opposite, right? Because I don't have it. So he did, and now he's met, now he has a golf team, right? Because he met one guy, they started talking. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, he had a golf shirt on. Oh, you play golf? I do. Do you play golf? I do. Next thing you know, you know they're playing golf. So if you're, depending on what you are, try something different and see how that works for you. And if you live in, I should have asked this question, how many of you actually live in Cary? Anyone? Okay. If you have, and if you don't live in Cary, if you have any questions about Carrie, you now know somebody on the council, right? And, and I might not know the answer, but I probably have somebody who works for me who does. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. I, what I will do is open this up for questions, and then you guys can tell me what you think and what's going on for you, because the best part of this is getting to meet you. I have a mic that I'm going to pass around to everyone so um, people who have logged in on Zoom or want to watch playback can hear you guys ask your questions. Um, so just raise your hand and I'll pass this around. And people on Zoom, if you guys want to, um, if you guys want to ask your questions, um, just type them in and then the facilitator in the rooms or um, Dennis or I will check on the screen to ask your question for you. So what do you do whenever you run into a big roadblock, like the first time, like you didn't get elected, like do you allow yourself time to kind of like grieve or, you know, feel sad about that or how long does that take or how do you like regroup and feel confident about moving forward? I actually like when I, one of the talks I give is I do all my failures in a talk, right? All of them. I mean, as many as I can, because I think sometimes when people get up, like I, I gave you a little bit of both, right? Um, I don't think people talk enough about their failures because we learn way more from our failures than we do from our successes. That one in particular was really hard. So my kids were, um, one was 10 and one was seven at that time. And um, it was hard on them because I had them in sandwich boards, vote for my mom on Davis Drive you know, and going with me door to door, right, and meeting people. Um, that one was hard because they took it personally too, right? So the first thing I did was cry, um, but not in front of anyone, and not in front of the kids um, because I wanted them to see the whole path, right? You know, kind of like the um, uh, dealing with grief, all, you know, like, oh my God, right? You know, I can't believe this is happening to me. This isn't happening to me. You know, 100 votes. I'm sure it's wrong, right? Um, yeah, I let myself wallow for a little bit. And then um, I decided I wanted to do something 
I wanted to keep doing something. But I was pretty sure I wasn't going to run again. Um, because putting your name on a, on a piece of paper on the side of the road and then losing is really, really hard, right? Uh, and I didn't think I wanted to run again. Um, but actually, my daughter was the first one to ask me if I was going to run again and when I was going to run. So I think kids are pretty insightful. So any of those roadblocks, I think it, it's valuable to really feel it, right? And then to analyze it. Um, hardly anyone wins their first election because it's a name ID thing. People like to vote. By the way, people like to vote for women in general. Um, it's why I, Beverly Lake, who is a guy, by the way, um, and he doesn't go by Beverly. Um, he's a judge. He keeps it, I, Beverly Lake, on the ballot. He's actually a very nice person, but he's told me that. Um, people like women judges, right? And uh, if you thought you were voting for a woman, sorry, because um, he doesn't look anything like a woman. Um, and so I had to kind of, you know, reevaluate what I wanted to do. And I said, you know what? I came really close. I came really close. I think I could do this again. And it took me uh, a couple of years, right? Because, and plus elections are only every other year, um, to reevaluate. And the same thing is true of just from an office perspective. Um, when I was in sales and as a systems engineer, I thought we would get on the calls. You know, we have a, at Cisco, we have, um, monthly calls, right, for our quota, et cetera. And um, in the beginning, we were talking about, you know, sales that were on the horizon, sales who were closing, all these different things. Um, and we started, we changed our mind, and we started talking about failures and what we learned from the failure. And we didn't talk about any upcoming sales, how we, how we lost, why we lost, and what we were going to do differently. So I think there's, a, there's a more value to failures than other ways. And actually, do solutions bought books for you. So because you asked the first question, you get the first book. Yeah, now, now you all are thinking. Do we have a book for you guys over there as well. So if you guys want to submit some questions, we'll give that away. Their question. There's a book in it for you. Yeah. I know you should change them with life events, but is there a timeline? Like you should just like every five years um, kind of look at, look, your, look at your list and see if I need to add someone, delete someone. I mean. Um, I You know, I don't know, not inspired, right? five or six months, so I haven't really connected with her. So it, it really is about what you need at the time and when you need it. I don't think it's ever harmful to have a slate of people that you have at your disposal at any time. I 
Going back to mentors, how, for somebody that is young, that is, you know, not, I'm, I guess, eight years into my career now, how do you find those mentors? Like, you know, you mentioned the Salesforce CTO, but, you know, I don't have that person to call. How do you, how do you find those people? Um, that's a great question. And by the way, I didn't have them either. I met them on Twitter. Um, he, I was following, and it's a perfect example. He was following what we do because we're a Salesforce customer. The town of Kerry is a Salesforce customer. And uh, he was following some of the tweets. That I Worst possible thing they could say. What is the worst possible thing? Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's okay. You know, you say, you know what? I just gonna, I was just gonna ask. Thank you for considering it. Cool. It's okay for them to say now. Cold calling works, and the cold calling through another person that works too. Yeah. Okay. My question. Um, woman as a mom I'm not a mom yet but how do you balance the pressure of feeling like you have to you know tend to the home <laughs> is a really yeah. be everything and also be a business professional and also be involved in your community and how do you manage all of that um, there is no such thing there isn't of one thing, you are not doing anything else because you only have 100% to give. This thing, people say, oh, I gave 110%. Dude, that's not possible. I'm an engineer. It's just not, it's not possible. Um, the thing is you have to find strategies to help you get through the, the hard part. Here's some examples. Um, I used to make cupcakes for my kids' events at school. By the way, they like the ones from Harris Teeter better. Way easier, right? Another example. I, have you ever done this one? Here's a good one. You go and you stop to get gas, right? It's at 7-Eleven or Kangaroo or whatever. And you pull up to get the gas and then you remember, oh, we need milk and bread and whatever. So you think, oh, I got the baby in the car. I got to go to Harris Teeter and then get it on the way home. Hello, this kangaroo has milk and bread there oh my god it's 50 cents more but it is way way worth the 50 cents they're going all the way to Harris they're getting the kid in the whatever you gotta find little strategies right that are worth your time right um about I don't know two years into um my marriage I decided it's so worth a cleaning lady <laughs> right so 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 Right? It saved our marriage. Totally. <laughs> so worth it. Right? Right? Um, you know, and I think, you know, some jobs are easier for me. I will tell you another, another one is I gave the kids jobs around the house. Right? My slaves are now gone because they're, right, they've graduated and they're gone. So now I pay somebody else to do some of that. But, um, 
here's what you have to get over the fact that they will not clean the bathroom nearly as well as you will. And you cannot go back and clean it. You have to let that go, right? So little strategies like that will get you way, way far, right? You know what? It's okay to buy a rotisserie chicken at Costco than to not make one for an hour and a half that costs just about the same, right? You've got to find things that are okay but give you sanity, right? Just because your mother did it didn't make it right, right, in this day and age. Um, what, just another one. I, um, I'm Jewish, so we never ate ham growing up. Um, uh, which, boy, was I missing out. And I went to, I went to college and I was like, whoa, this is bacon? I cannot believe it. I had the turkey bacon for my whole life. Um, I went to my sister, sister-in-law's house and she was making ham for Christmas dinner and she took the ham and she got it and she cut off both ends of the ham and she put it in a pan and then she put it in the oven, right? And I was like, oh, that must be how you make ham. I'm Jewish. I don't know, right? So I made ham at, next time at my house. Um, my mother-in-law came over and she saw me cut off both ends and put it in there. And I'm like, she's like, what are you doing? I said, well, this, uh, this is how Allison made the ham. She goes, Allison did that? I'm like, yeah, it, I, I'm not a ham aficionado. What did I do wrong? She goes, I used to cut off both ends because the hams never fit in my pan. So figure out why you do the things you do because there might not be a really good reason for it. Always question them. I think you might find, a, find that as helpful. Any other questions? And you guys, there are two other books too, if, you have, if you've read this one. One of the questions that we got online um, says, how long do you keep the same mentors? Do you rotate them often? Um, that's, yeah, that's... To the uh, other question of, right, of like, what do I do with mentors? Do I, can, you know, do I actually, um, do I roll them out? You, it's whatever works for you, right? It's whatever works for you. If you have a mentor that, that's like been your touchstone and maybe now become your best friend, keep that one. Um, but yeah, it's okay to let, the hardest thing is to let things go. And you can let them go easily because they're not serving you anymore. Or you can find a new one because you have a new gap to fill. Like my new gap to fill right now is what do I want to be next, right? Do I want to reinvent myself, right? Do I just want to retire and go off into the sunset? I need a totally different set of mentors for that. The people who got me here aren't necessarily going to be the ones who get me there. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure. You guys, is this, you're the first younger type group that I've talked to in a really long time. I could speak a little bit faster here. I didn't have to do like any southern stuff, you know, southern draw. So thank you so much. I have a, I have a business card. And Carrie, even if not, thank you, Lori. Let's give her a hand.